evening. It's good to be with you tonight. And glad that you're with us and able to be out. I must admit, a little, a little jealous that some of our family members going on a vacation, Disney vacation, they they went from drastically 80 degree beach weather to 30s rainy and cold. So that's a big change. But uh, we're glad that uh, they're back and made it safe, so I'm glad you're here. I was disappointed, not disappointed, that's a strong word. I was hurt, my feelings were hurt. When Jeff told us, told me that there's no visits right now for us. If you have not signed up, you have not allowed us to come visit. I'll be honest with you, the purpose of these visits is to know you. It's not for me to lecture you, it's not for me to give a sermon. I give all my sermons on Sunday. I let you give the sermon, and just know about you has really helped me to get to know the church, to put a face, to put a name, and tie an experience. It really helps me to know you better, and I feel like for me to be a better preacher uh, and to be a better servant of God is to know who I'm speaking to, and many of you have shared very personal things, and it's amazing to just just to see such great faith in it, that I'm standing before, faith greater than mine, for what you've gone through and what you've been through. So tonight is kind of talking about that. I love verse 24, as, as Wendell read for us. He, he said to Jesus with tears, Lord, I believe. That helps. I am believe. Oh, I can relate to 24, verse 24. Can you relate to that statement? And you feel that statement sometimes, Lord, I believe in you, but boy, I could sure use some more, a little bit more belief. Help me when I unbelie- in my unbelief. Help me in my doubting. Help me when I question your authority and your will and your decision making. Help my unbelief. My father, my father recently, not too long ago, did a meeting, a week-long gospel meeting. It's almost unheard of, isn't it? From Sunday to Friday, deep in the state of Alabama. The very beginning day on the Sunday where the meeting started, the preacher of that congregation received awful news. His son had a massive heart attack and died. His daughter-in-law was so shocked by that that she had a minor heart attack, but she survived it. She had three children, 11, 5, You've heard things like that. You have experienced similar and different but hard things in your life. But does these things that we hear and that we experience, do they ever test your faith? Does it ever make you question, is this... Is this religion? Is Christianity? Is this God? Is it really? Is it really true? Is it really? Is you know? Because life can make us really question things, and the things that we experience in life can make us question. And if we've ever struggled with our faith, we are in good company. It's because some of the greats have. Elijah, the great prophet that was able to be with Jesus when he transfigured on that mountain top. One of the greatest prophets who was able to bypass physical death. But in 1 Kings chapter 19, he he had a, a pity party. He had a depression set in. And he, he told God deep in the cave that I am alone. There's no one else like me. And yet God reminded him that there's 8,000 other people just like you. What about Jeremiah? What a, what a tremendous hardship that he had. Here, Jeremiah, we need, I need you to be a, a preacher and a prophet and, and to go to God's people who are doomed. And they're going to be stiff-necked. They're not going to listen to you. They're not going to respond. And you need to do this for 40 years. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 1, and told God his tears and emotions because of what he had to endure and what he was going through. It's just difficult. Then I think about Peter who had trouble staying on top of the water and Jesus invited him out and and he was walking a little bit and we know the story as the wind the waves started to ramp up he became, the fisherman became afraid of the waters that he had grown up on and known. He became afraid of it. 
and he sank and Jesus brought him up out of the water and saved him and says, oh, you of little faith. He struggled at that moment. Then what parent who has a child that's going through something difficult that we cannot fix, we cannot help, it's beyond our hands. As I think about this father with this unique situation of his son who has been demon-possessed, who had convulsions and foaming at the mouth and, and, and twitching and falling to the ground and the demon throwing him into the fire and in the water. Why, any parent would struggle as this father would struggle. We'd all would, I would think, honestly, if we're really honest with ourselves, we would come to Jesus and question, Lord, I do believe, but, but there's a lot of unbelief I have because I have a hard time grasping what's going on here or why it's happening. As he cried out, you know what? There's nothing more central to Christianity than the idea of faith. And there's no need more crucial than for us to strengthen the faith that we have. Faith begins by hearing the Word of God, but it doesn't stop there. It must grow, it must develop, it must mature. Because the end of our faith is the salvation of our souls. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 9. We are told repeatedly that we are to live by faith. That comes from Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk, the minor prophet, questioned God, why is this happening? Why, why are people that are more wicked than us overtaking us and God told him to write down what I'm about to say I want other people to know it and so what he, God told Habakkuk was this the just shall live by faith that statement has been repeated in Galatians it's been repeated in Romans and it's been repeated in Hebrews we are to live by faith not by sign we cannot please God without faith it's impossible as I mentioned last week we are to have the shield of faith as we defend ourselves from the wickedness of this world and especially of the evil one. It is the victory to overcome this world. Faith is the victory. But even with the importance of faith, there can be times in our life when events happen, when things take place to where we even question, or we can, with what we believe in what we trust. You look at something, how could something tragically happen to something like a child? We could struggle with that. We can allow that to entertain. We can entertain it a lot to where we need help, not with what we just believe in. We need, we need help with our, our unbelief. Let's consider this story and maybe helping us to strengthen our faith wherever we may be in our life and the journey and our process that we're in to making sure that we are leaving here with strong faith, faith that can grow and mature as we continue to stretch it, as the world stretches it, so that we can continue to trust God and depend upon Him even more, especially in things that we don't understand. I have an answer for it. We need to trust God even more. It's not surprising that if you look in Mark chapter 9, the very beginning was a very high moment. It was when Jesus took Peter, James, and John to that mountaintop, and there he was transfigured into a different form. And as he did that, obviously Moses and Elijah appeared with him, and that event happening, and they were talking about what Jesus would fulfill in Jerusalem. They're talking about his death that would soon happen. And obviously God making it clear with Peter trying to make three different altars that this is my son whom I love, hear him. It's always nice to be at the mountaintop. When I say mountaintop, I think about camps. I think about retreats. I think about really spiritual uplifting moments to where we, we set aside the things and the cares of this world and we're together with God's people and we just... We just really grow from that. We're inspired by that. It builds us up. But then we got to realize we got to leave that and come back to the world because that's really the majority of our life. It, it's, it's down off the mountaintop. It's there among the playing fields where we mix among the people as well as the problems of life. That's the majority of our life. We can't always be on the mountaintop. We can't always be at those places because we have to be among the life. First and foremost, we have to make a living. 
And we have to learn to be equipped and live in the world that we live in day in and day out that we face. So as they came down off this mountain, there is immediately this problem that, that, that persisted among them. There was this desperate father asking Jesus to help with his unbelief. He openly confessed in looking at and thinking about this as this led to that. If you look at verse 17, the father steps out of the crowd. He says, teacher, I brought my son who has a mute spirit. If we use the accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which all give us this story but provide different details, here's what we can summarize. Number one is this. The man had only one son, the one that he brought to Jesus. Luke chapter 9, 28 tells us that the boy was unable to hear, but he was also unable to speak. Imagine being in the pain and agony that that boy had, but unable to physically express it with his mouth. Or hear his father say, son, I'm with you, I'm comforting you, I'm going to fix the problem, I'm going to find the solution. He was demon-possessed. As I mentioned, the demon would throw him on the ground, the demon would, would cause him to foam at the mouth and grind his teeth and throw him in the fire and the water. And we don't know the age of the boy, how long this had gone on in this boy's life, but I just wonder, when I read about people that endure things in the Bible, what always enters my mind is, what did they look like? Did you have second degree burns, first degree burns? Did you have in some places third degree burns? What did he look like? What had his body endured to the suffering? You know, problem of evil is a major reason why there's unbelief. The problem of evil is why many people struggle with faith. Why some cry out, Lord, I, I, I need help with my unbelief. I, I struggle with my faith because I don't understand why this would happen this way and play out that way. You know, we see evil as something as troubling because why is, why is something bad happening to what we would presume as something that is good, someone that is good? And so it appears as this boy who has been afflicted since his childhood, and, and, and we would naturally as readers, even we would say that this boy doesn't deserve what he's going through. Why is the demon permitted to go and afflict him in such a way? Why is it in this situation like this? Why does the father have to deal with this situation? And how is it the disciples cannot even fix the problem? What I find interesting is when I read this story is his father's presented to Jesus that, that even in the presence of Jesus, problems don't disappear. Jesus saw, he was aware, he saw the boy go down as he did. He saw what was taking place. And all this took place in front of Jesus in his presence. It wasn't like he was just going on word of mouth and going on what the Father says. But I find interesting what Jesus says. Faithless generation. What he says beginning there. The scribes who were questioning disciples and why they couldn't do what they thought that they could do. They had no faith. The multitudes that followed their faith was very surface level. It was, well, what have you done for me, Jesus? If you can do what we want, if you can feed our tummies, if you can heal whoever that we think we should heal, then we'll follow you. But, but when you start teaching and when you start telling us what we need to be doing, well, eh, I, don't, I don't know about that. And so the Father and the disciples' faith were very much shaken by the situation. The only one present that had unquestionable faith in Jesus was obviously the demon that had possessed the boy, because even the demons believed, and they shuddered. Other occasions where demons would possess people, they would say to Jesus, have you come to destroy us before our time? And how interesting, the most evil thing is that of demons, but yet they had more faith in who, the capability and the person, the identity of Jesus, than us as creation, than us as people. Would we, how would we respond today if that took place? Do we, 
Do we sometimes throw our hands up in circumstantial events? Is God confined to a moment, to an event, to, 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 to something that I'm going through? Is, is, are we going to belittle God to that moment? And some people do that. that God, God is, God's confined to this death. God's confined to this disease. God's confined to, to whatever I'm facing. And if, it's not, if, if I don't get what I want, then, then I'm just going to abandon God. I'm not going to follow Him. God is not a problem. God is not a circumstance. God is not a situation that's difficult. God is God, the creator, the sustainer of this life. He's bigger than any moment and problem, any day that we go through, any event that we go through. He's much bigger than that. The problem we have as people is when we start to minimize who God is. We cannot equate God to one event. We cannot th say whether it's fair or unfair that God is good, therefore life must be good. We can't do that. Because A, we are creation itself and we're not God. And B, God cannot be defined by a moment. He's infinite. He's all-knowing. He's all-everywhere. And so is our faith wrapped up in whether we have success, whether, whether, whether our days are good and, and everything is going well and, and our faith is going? And I, and I would propose to you, if, if that's your life and that's your mentality, you're no different than the multitudes that got their tummies filled, that, 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 that got their way, and Jesus met a need. They were willing to follow Jesus. They were willing to make him the prophet and the king. They were willing to prop him up to where he needed to be until life got difficult. And they stopped. When the boy came to Jesus, the, the Spirit caused the boy to fall on the ground to wallow in his own foam. Jesus asked the boy's condition. Notice as the father had said, and maybe maybe a little little sprinkling of doubt, but if you can do anything, if, if, you can do it. The father's request was tainted maybe with some doubt. The disciples, I don't blame it, the disciples who were followers of Jesus, who had the power to heal and cast out demons, they tried to, to help the father's son. They failed. Disciples minus the three, Peter, James, and John, had went with Jesus. So here he comes to the master, the rabbi, and says, Hey, your disciples were unsuccessful. If you could do anything, that would sure be appreciated. The scribes were disputing the disciples that their failure to do something, their failure to, to do what they had claimed that they could do. However, the true if was not with Jesus, but it was with the Father. In Mark chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus says, If you can believe all things possible, all possible to him who believes. So Jesus turns it back to the Father. It's the challenge, through what Jesus is saying, the challenge is not with God, the challenge is with us. Our expectation for God doesn't make God exist. I've said this before, but it, it bears repeating at this point. If none of us believed in God, there still would be a God. Our believing and thinking and wanting and desiring doesn't make God or create Him. He made us. So the problem was with the Father. God is God, regardless if your prayer is answered the way you pray, regardless if the situation is met according to your liking or not. He's God. Paul reminds us of that when he asks three times for the thorn, thorn the flesh to be removed. And he was told that. He still saw God as God. The concern is not whether God can heal the boy. The concern is whether or not can you believe in the actual God of heaven and earth? Can you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? That's the, that's the overall question. 
is not whether you, can you meet this need in my life, it's whether will you bow down and surrender all other things and submit to me. Can you do that? If your faith is maybe failing you and, and you feel like you're being tested more than usual, have you approached God with the correct problem? The problem is not a sick relative. The problem is not diseased body. The problem is not having a bad day. It's not the loss of a job. The problem is how you see God. The lack of it. There are so many distractions. These are symptoms of what the problem is. Where my faith is at. Have I been really honest with myself? Or have I pretended that I'm where I need to be when really I'm not? Like the Father, it's a time to be open and honest and confess to God the real problem, to get to a point in our prayer to say, God, I really believe that life is struggling. Life is testing me and it's tempting me. And I'm really starting to have some doubts and unbelief. And I know that it's not with these things. It really is my relationship to you. And I want to better that. Tell you something, folks. If our relationship is where it is with God, then, then then whatever we face in life, we can overcome. Because the Bible says that with faith, we can overcome this world. If God is who He says He is, and we have that, in, and He is the God of our life, and we love Him with every being and fiber of our life, and we trust in Him and lean not on our understanding, then the things, the symptoms of this life, because of weak faith, will not will not be there. That doesn't mean we'll have a bad day. Does that mean we'll have disappointments? It doesn't mean that we will feel like we're defeated in some things. That's some, those are natural human things that are going to happen. But at the end of the day, God is God. And we haven't dethroned Him because of the problem. The second point that I want to share is this, and that is faith trusted. It wasn't read for us, but if you read a little bit further in verse verse 25, after he heals and everything is done, the disciples come privately to ask Jesus. In verse 28, when he had come into the house, the disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he says to them, this time can come out by nothing but prayer. They question their own their own belief. They question their own ability. Why can't we why couldn't we fix the problem? Why couldn't we help the father and his son? They had cast out demons prior to this problem in Mark chapter six, verse thirteen, it tells us of that. Why couldn't they do what they had done before at this moment? According to Mark's account in Mark 17, verse 20, Jesus says to them, Because of your little faith, your faith is little. They had reversed what the Lord had taught them. They had they went from can to cannot do. They had failed to do what they should do and what they had succeeded to do. Yet Mark adds that this, this kind can, cannot come out unless it's by prayer and it's by fasting I think that's interesting why Mark provides that and why Jesus says that what's interesting in this fact is it may be because the disciples are kind of waning a little bit in their prayer line I mean it's a natural tendency if you're given the power to heal and cast out demons and you start doing that what begins to happen when you can do extraordinary things that you once could not do? Start focusing on what I can do and my what I can accomplish in, in my abilities and we can lose our sight on no what really is going on is God. God is here. It's really not you're just an instrument. You're just jars of clay. That's all you are. See, in our culture, in our world, even today, it's me, myself, and I. We want to promote ourselves. We want to get our agenda out there. We want people to recognize us and how good we are and how well we do things. 
And that's the temptation. It's always been a temptation. Isn't that going back to the very beginning in the garden where it, when the serpent says, you can be like God. Oh, wow. That's, we've been following that since then. Instead of submitting to the only God, promoting ourselves to do like God. Disciples were not where they needed to be spiritually to be able to do this. It appears that the Lord was maybe pointing that out to them in, in a very dramatic way. And, and by this cannot come out by prayer and fasting, separate prayer and fasting. We need to understand about prayer for this moment. Prayer is, is really not getting the answers we want. That's not what prayer is about. It's not bowing our heads, you know, and, and, and focusing our minds to God and letting God know and ask and you shall receive. Ask anything in my name and you'll receive. It's not really about just asking and expecting what we want. Really, prayer is about us expressing, in a very profound way, expressing our dependency upon God. Needing God. Some have believed, looking at this, that maybe the disciples' faith had failed because they had shifted their belief in, from God to maybe what they could do. And now they were looking at what they could not do and how they could fix that. See, God was teaching them, and Jesus was teaching them, what you need to be worried about is not what you can or cannot do ability-wise. What you need to be worried about and concerned about is your relationship to God and where that relationship is. That's always been the ultimate objective. That's always been the number one thing. It's a patriarchal thing. It's a mosaical thing. It's even a Christian thing. God needs to be God and Lord of our life. Period. Period. Jesus, as he pointed to that, you know, it's much easier for us to as we think about when God gives us, He blesses us with the things that we can do, and it doesn't take long before we go through life and think, ah, you know, I can wing it, I can do it because I'm good at doing this. And we start relying on our own ability. We start relying on what we can do and rather than what God is able to do and who God is. Before you know it, we soon forget what we've been taught. We soon forget what we believed in, and we go backwards rather than going forwards. We set ourselves up for failure. Faith begins at hearing God's word. The faith doesn't end there. Faith must be fed. Faith must mature. And that maturity comes both in the good and the bad of life. It comes from the blessings and the difficulties that we face. And they're all reminders to make sure to assess whether or not it's not the events that take place that's the importance. What is the importance is how I view God. And where God what God should do in my life. Who we should be like. He is still the God of the universe. He is still the God of this world. He will continue to be, whether we doubt in Him, whether we, we deny what He does, He still will be there. But He invites us. He invites us to come to Him. He invites us to, 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 to trust in Him and to know that, that God has been around much longer than any of us and God has seen anything, everything you can think of and God has seen us up to this point. We still need to continue trusting Him. Even though we may not see, we still lean on Him, knowing that He will give us and lead us where we need to go. He is the good shepherd, is He not? He guide us and lead us. We just have to trust in Him. And yes, with truth we know we, we can relate to the Father. Believe, help my unbelief. We help your unbelief. It's not because of your problem. It's not because of what has kept you. It is everything to do with how you see God. Or the lack of sin. We need to always to tell God in such a way that we deserve as the God of heaven and earth. 
Jesus is teaching and modeling that it begins in a prayer with God and focusing on God. Hallowed be his name. Reverend is his name. Thinking about what God has done. I'm going to close with Acts chapter 4. I would say this is a continuation of what we just looked at, the problem, the disciples' question, but then we see a exchange, a turnaround, and learning from life. In Acts chapter 4, when Peter and John had been arrested and been threatened to never teach Christianity, to never go and, and talk about these things, a good scare tactic, if you will, how did the church respond? What did they do? They prayed to God. And notice what they prayed. I'm going to read their prayer, and then I'll close with this. When they heard it, Heard what had happened, that is, Peter and John arrested and threatened and beaten and so forth. They raised their voice to God in one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. And by the mouth of your servant David have said, Why the nations raised and the people fought vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand. The rulers were gathered together and against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you've anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose had come before be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants with all bones that they may speak your word. The entirety of that prayer was about God. It was about the nature of God in that scary time and that threat of persecution. It was about God. That's faith. That's where faith needs to be. The more we focus on God, the more we focus on our relationship with God, the more our faith will grow. And the mature the way it needs to be in this life. Sam is selected to be a focus song. We're going to stand and sing. Let me tell you something. You're going to have good days. I see in your future good days. I even see bad days. I see difficulties. I see things that come that are unexpected. I see things that come that are expected. I see the un things that happen that we didn't plan. I hope that I can see and you can see it in yourself and all of it. My faith is constantly progressing up. It's true. The job is still doing what God is doing. Regardless of what is happening. And we need to be mindful of that. Who can help you to encourage you, pray for you, need strength, need forgiveness, whatever it is. Need your faith to grow and be clear. And need to stop doubting. Be a good help one another. In this life that we live together, we struggle together, we are here together to help each other. We can do that and pray over you. We'd love to do that. It's a day that we all